Well, it is so good to see each and every one of you. If you're a guest here, uh, we're thrilled that you have joined us. I've met actually uh, several guests um, over the last 15 minutes, and I just want to share just a few thoughts about who we are. Uh, as a people, we believe that life is about Jesus. If you're wondering, who are all these people? They kind of gather together and they're singing to Jesus. Uh, we believe uh, that all things come from him. Life is to be lived through him, and we're all going to return to him, which means that we're going to answer to him. And that means that life is about Jesus. And God has called us as his followers uh, to bring glory to God by seeking to introduce all peoples, doesn't matter where they live, to Christ, and to grow them up to love and worship him. And we believe the Bible is true. And because we believe the Bible is true, when we gather, what we do is we give um, extra time to reading it, looking at it, and seeing how do we really apply it to our life. And what you find within the Bible is there is a central thing that God Almighty has called us to do after Jesus rose from the dead, and that is to go into all the world and to make disciples in all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and then to teach them everything that he taught, everything that he has recorded within the Bible. That's our commission and there is a characteristic, a central one, that the Bible tells us that Jesus himself said when he was on the earth, now this will be how you go about doing that commission. He says, by this, all people will know that you're my disciples by the way that you love one another. And so we want to reach people, we want to grow people, and we want to do it in a way, in an environment, an atmosphere of love, which is why we're really, really glad that you are here. We're in a series, this is week 32, in a series through Mark. Mark has won four Gospels. We're going to work through the last passage in chapter 10 this morning, and then I want to tell you that for the next two months, we're going to hit pause on Mark, okay? Not pause, pause on the Bible. Every time we gather, we're going to open up the Bible. Pause on Mark. I'm going to tell you what we're going to do. Every November, we set aside some time to think about God's big heart for all peoples. And so we're going to start a series next week called All Peoples, simply looking and at how God has called us to make disciples in all nations. He's going to call many of us to do something significant with our life over the next year towards this task. And then we want to reimagine what would he call each and every one of us to do. For some of us, it simply means that he's going to call us this next year to pray for people who don't have the gospel or to pray for people who are leaving this place to go to other places to reach people with the gospel. For others, it may be to give financially. For others, it may be to go, to go on a short-term trip or perhaps to go for a long time or perhaps to serve in these ways. There's something for each and every one of us. And on November 8th and 9th, normally when we have a missions weekend, missions festival is what we have called it for a long time, there's a meal on that Friday night. And again, there'll be a meal on that Friday night. It's November 8th and November 9th this year, though. It's Friday night and Saturday night. And the reason is because um, we couldn't fit everybody last year. So we're going to do it this year on both nights. And we would ask you, would you consider praying between now and then? God, what would you have me to do? How can I participate? But then second, would you go and register? If you go to pray.org slash info, um, and you're gonna find five different buttons. And the fourth button down, it says, well, it looks just like this. And you just hit on that, and you can register. We would love for you to be there. It's a night, literally, where you're gonna hear all kinds of stories from folks who live overseas, who come back to share what the Lord is doing, and then to Imagine how we can be a part of that. After November, it's December. We're going to look at a series about Christmas, and then we will return back to Mark in January. Now, if I'm being totally honest with you, I completely understand that some of you don't care what I just said, okay? Um, I mean, you care, like, oh, that's great, you're going to do something, but you don't care primarily because today you're just so burdened, life is so heavy that future preaching plans aren't necessarily ointment to your soul. And I totally understand that. And so what we want to do today with the rest of our time is to try to be that ointment, to serve you, to care for you, even in this passage, to show you that the Lord sees you, he hears you, and he wants to help you, I am convinced. That's what we're going to do in a moment. I'm going to pray, 
But in 30 minutes from now, we're going to have a time to respond by singing and praying. And some of us were so tired of carrying something and praying about something that we need someone else to help us. And so at the end of our time, we're going to sing two songs. But at the end of those songs, or not at the end of the songs, while we're singing, there's going to be a bunch of people who are standing up here who would love the opportunity to help you to carry that burden to the Lord if we can help you this morning. So let me pray. Father in heaven, we bow before you. Thank you for your kindness to us. We acknowledge you in all of these ways that your word is true and that you have given us a mission and you have given us a characteristic that should drive how we treat people and how we do the mission of love. And we want to do it your way. And so as we open your word now, would you speak through weakness? Would you cause our hearts to be amazed at the greatness and mercy of Jesus? And would you help us to see that you welcome us to draw near to you in confidence, to lay before you the burdens upon our heart. And so help us now, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. If you have a Bible, if you would turn with me to Mark chapter 10, and the sermon title today is something, it's a line within the text, what do you want me to do for you? Jesus is the one who will say this to real people, and I believe that he would say it even to us Today. Now, Mark is one of four Gospels, eyewitness accounts of the life of Jesus. And every one of the four Gospels have a very specific stated goal of what they're trying to do in writing. And Mark is not the exception. He tells us in verse 1 what he hopes to explain and show us throughout the rest of his Gospel account. And that is that Jesus is the Christ, the promised one, and that he is the Son of God. And so today, however, we reach sort of a milestone in our study through Mark, and you can only really understand that if you understand a little bit of the timeline of what's happening in Mark. This is sort of crude, this is not precise, but it's close. And so Mark chapters 1 through 8, eight chapters, feature two and a half years in the life and ministry of Jesus, okay? And so Mark is unlike Matthew and Luke in that it doesn't start with his birth, it starts with his public ministry, okay? That was just his intent. And for two and a half years, he shows us Jesus literally walking all over Israel, primarily in the north region, healing people, showing power and authority and his glory over all things. He gets to the end of those two and a half years. He looks at his disciples in the eyes and he says, who do you say that I am? Who do you really believe that I am? And Peter, on behalf of all of them, says, we have come to believe this, that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And having melted their unbelief in who he is, He spends the next six months, which is Mark chapter 9 and 10, walking them from the north of Galilee all the way down to Jerusalem. And while he is walking in there, he's redefining their understanding of how he, the Christ, is going to save them and how they as his disciples and we as his followers are to follow him. Now all of a sudden we get to the last passage in Mark chapter 10. Well, the last six chapters in Mark, which will start in January and go all the way to Easter, it features one week. It's the next text, if you just look at Mark chapter 11, verse 1, it's when he comes into Jerusalem and people are laying down palm branches. And so it's backloaded. It's very heavy that last week because of what is done in that last week by Jesus is so important. Mark wants to give primacy of text to that week. But we come to this moment in time, which is pretty amazing. This is his very last stop in our text, just before his very last week when he goes to the cross. And all of this last stop happens in a place called Jericho. Look what it says starting in uh, verse 46. And they came to Jericho. And as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, call him. 
They called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he's calling you. Throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. Jesus said to him, Go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. Now, what I want to show you today from these, just these few verses are some truths that for some of us, if you walk with the Lord a long time, this, this is not going to be surprising to you. But one thing it will be to you, it's, it will be ointment to your soul, in particular if you are carrying a heavy burden today. The first thing I want you to see here is that Jesus hears the cries of the desperate. He hears. And all of this takes place in a place called Jericho. Now, some of us, we remember from kids, oh, that story about Jericho and the walls falling down and Joshua, and, and all of that's true. That happened a long time before this. The, the Jericho of Jesus' day, I'm going to call it the modern Jericho, okay? I realize it was 2,000 years ago, so it's not modern to us, but it was modern in that moment. It lied just south of the ancient ruins of old Jericho that fell and was destroyed at the time of Joshua. So if you can imagine, this amazing city that fell, it was toppled, and instead of rebuilding that city in that same place, they just rebuilt a city right next to it. So you have ancient Jericho and modern Jericho, which for us, they're all ancient. This Jericho of Jesus' day was located just 17 miles from Jerusalem making it the perfect rest stop for Jewish pilgrims traveling all over Israel to Jerusalem for its feast. And this feast, if you remember what Jesus is going to, is the Passover. And so this city at this time is populated with people. It's the last stop. And sometimes when we think of Jericho, we think of the old Jericho, we think of broken ruins, and so we feel it's harsh and cold and, or maybe hot and it's uncomfortable. It's just a bunch of rocks. But the Jericho of Jesus' day was actually a pretty lush, beautiful oasis kind of town. It was known for its spring water, its palm trees, its gardens, its almonds, its citrus fruits and orchards. It was so beautiful that Herod the Great, when he was in, um, um, in power, it got cold in Jerusalem. But for whatever reason, just 17 miles away in Jericho, it was so temperate that he decided to build his palace there, a little winter palace where he could go, and he eventually died there. It was also so beautiful that Mark Antony, remember that from history, he decided to give Cleopatra a gift to honor her, and what he gave her was the beautiful city of Jericho. And yet we're told here is not everyone enjoyed its beauty because not everyone could see its beauty. In verse 46, we're introduced to a man, Bartimaeus, who's a beggar, but he's blind, which means a blind man is living in a city of beauty and he cannot see it. It says that he has a dad. We'll sort of get to his names in a moment, and he's sitting by the roadside. Now, a blind man in any culture at any time is suffering something that is really difficult. We could all imagine that. We can all see that. Some of us would even fear it. But to be a blind person in first century Israel was especially difficult. And the reason is because culture had gotten so confused that they began to attribute blindness in an individual to God's judgment upon them. So for example, in John chapter 9, we're introduced to a man who was born blind. And Jesus is walking with his disciples, and his disciples ask Jesus a question. It's amazing what they ask. They say, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And there was no check in their spirit of saying, oh my gosh, how in the world? I should probably say that in private because it would probably offend the sensibilities of the culture. No, everyone was wondering the same thing. Who sinned? And so... This Bartimaeus would have been ostracized by everyone except those in the city who were equally stricken. In fact, Mark 
writes the story, but so does Matthew and Luke. And in Matthew's story, if you read it, there's two blind men. They had each other. Friends, ostracized from everybody else. Now Mark's not lying by featuring one. If there were two blind men, then by default there was one as well. And he simply focuses on Bartimaeus. But what do we know about Bartimaeus? We know he was a blind man in the city of beauty, familiar with despair. And he was left to beg from the very community who considered him cursed. This is a real need. This is a real man with a real burden. And there's some things that he lived through that I believe we can live or or learn from. You see, if you're a blind person, you wonder if you're seen. Some of you are looking at me right now. My eyes work, so I know that I'm seen. But if I was blind, I wouldn't know if you're looking at me or not. I can see, and so sometimes I can say, hey, raise your hand. And if you raise your hand, I'd say, oh, they can hear me as well. But if you're blind, you don't know if they hear. If you're blind, you wonder about the significance of my life. But isn't it interesting? Here's a man who can't see. He wonders if he is heard, if he's seen, if he's significant. And isn't it amazing that many of us who can see, we wonder the same thing? Am I really heard? All these people in the world, am I really significant? Am I seen? Does God see me? Does anyone else see me? Names told a big story in first century Israel and even before. We name somebody a name because we like to name. And then we think, oh, I wonder what it means. But I don't know what your name means. If I say, hey, what's your name? You say, my name is Ashley. I go, oh, cool, Ashley. I wouldn't know what Ashley, I, don't, I still don't know what Ashley means. But in this culture, your name was given to tell people something about you. It told a characteristic about you or something that was happening at the time of your birth. It was, it was revelation of who you were to the culture. And so when people know, knew your name, they knew something about you. But it's interesting is throughout these gospel stories and throughout even history, as we look back at first century Israel, what we know is this, is that people knew your name unless you were afflicted. And if you were afflicted, you were simply the man born blind. You were knew, known by your distress. The woman had a bleeding condition. That's what we know. That became her identity, his identity. And it's interesting that Mark tells us, you go, wait a minute, this guy got a name. No, he doesn't. You see, it says his name is Bartimaeus. It's true, but Bar means son of Timaeus. He doubles down and he simply says it again, son of Timaeus. His dad's had a name that everyone knew what it meant. It meant greatly valued, highly valued. But for his son, no one knew anything about him other than he was a blind beggar and that he was the son of a highly valued man. And some of us feel that. We don't know if we are seen, heard, or significant, but we know our mom or dad is because they're highly valued. And this is where Bartimaeus, (laughs) this is his life. His life until the son of Timaeus cried out to the son of David. And then everything changed. Verse 47, it says, when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And in Luke and Matthew's gospel, it says that as a blind man, he wasn't sure what was happening. So he asked, he says, what's the commotion? It feels like there's extra people right now. There's, there's more activity. There's more energy. And they say, oh, it's Jesus. Mark just picks up on And when he heard that it was Jesus, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Sometimes we use the words cry out to the Lord in prayer. And sometimes what we imagine, the the idea of cry out is, oh, I'm going to go home or perhaps I'm going to sit here. We're going to be like if I said, hey, we're going to take a moment of silence and just let you cry out to the Lord. And we would associate cry out as, oh, okay, I'm going to put my hands like this and I'm going to pray and I'm cry out to the Lord and and. And that's crying out to the Lord. It's a version of it, but that's not this version. Because the word cry out here is from a word, krazo, 
That means to scream. This word is also used in the book of Revelation, chapter 12, to describe the screaming of a woman who's giving birth. In other words, Bartimaeus' cry out to Jesus was not clean. It wasn't composed. It it was not dignified. But it did have content. Not a lot of content, but just enough. He calls Jesus the son of David. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, Isaiah chapter 11, Jeremiah chapter 32, it says a prophecy that the Christ is going to come to the line of David. It says that the stump of Jesse, which was David's dad, became a stump. It was cut off. It says, but one day there's going to become a branch, a righteous branch that comes from the stump of David. He's going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. He's going to die for our sin. He's going to make all things new. In other words, when Bartimaeus says to Jesus, you're the son of David, he was saying, I believe you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And this is important because in John chapter 9, an event that's already happened, the Pharisees and scribes and religious elite had made an edict over Israel that anybody who would claim that Jesus is the son of David must be evicted permanently from the synagogue, removed from society. But Bartimaeus doesn't care because he's already evicted. He's already ostracized. And so he just boldly says, this is what I know. You're the son of God. You are the son of David. You're the promised one. And then notice what he asked for. Have mercy. Mercy is not a cry where we argue our merits. It's a cry where we confess a lack of them. He's saying, I don't deserve help right now, but I'm asking you for mercy. Verse 48, you can feel the disdain the city had toward him. It says that many rebuked him, telling him to be silent, but he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. It's so sad sometimes to see human behavior. Here's a man that is blind in a city of beauty. And he's looking at Jesus, who he knows to be the Son of God. He's asking for mercy. And the, titty, and the whole city tells him to shut up. They rebuke him. That means to correct him, to admonish him. It's amazing that Bartimaeus couldn't see anything, but he saw Christ more clearly than all of Jericho. And Jesus responds by stopping, verse 49 says, and he calls him. And then for the city, the people of Jericho called the blind man, saying to him, take heart, get up, he's, he's calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and he came to Jesus. This is amazing. I don't know why I've always enjoyed history, okay? I studied history, and sometimes when I read, like, I just enjoy reading, in particular about kings and, 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 and rulers, leaders, warriors, just to see how people led. It's an amazing thing. And I can simply tell you this. My study of the world is, is like microscopic in comparison to its, to its size. But this is what I know. There are very few kings through history that are known for stopping for blind beggars in the field. And yet Jesus, the Son of God, is one of them. And so let me urge you today to take heart because Jesus hears a humble cry. When the crowd heard Jesus call him, you see what they said? They said, take heart. Get on your feet and bring your problems to Jesus. And for us, I simply would lean on the same passage and say to you today, take heart. Get ready to get on your feet and bring your problems to Jesus. The second thing I hope you can see with me is that Jesus invites us to voice our need in prayer. Jesus' question to the man in verse 51 may feel utterly strange if you really think about it unless you understand something about the heart heart of Jesus. All this is happening. The man finally gets to being in front of Jesus and Jesus asks a question. What, What is it? What do you want me to do for you? Is there anyone in Jericho who doesn't know the answer to that? You know the answer to that. 
Did he not know the answer to that? No, of course he knew the answer to that. In fact, in Matthew chapter 6, verse Uh, verse 8, it says, listen, don't stack up empty phrases thinking that God's going to hear you that way. Your father knows what you need before you ask him. Then why, if he already knows, does he tell him or ask him, what do you want me to do for you? And the reason given through the entire scope of scripture is this. He loves you And he loves the tone of your voice. And he loves it when you and I go through a place where we finally recognize we do not have the solution in ourself. And so we turn Godward and ask him for mercy and help. Some of you as parents know what this is like. My wife Tabitha and I, we have three sons. The youngest is 21. We have three sons and one daughter-in-law now. And I love each one of them. And I love the tone of their voice. They call. I know what they sound like. And you know what else I love? I love when they ask me for help. Not because I'm needy and codependent. I just love to help them. I enjoy it. Some of you know that we have a son named Caleb who's in the Marines. If you remember when he left, it means you and I are four years older, okay? Um, He's been in four years almost now, and he just re-enlisted. He got to choose the base where his stuff is going to live, and so he chose North Carolina. Well, when he went out to Southern California, Camp Pendleton, he wanted his Jeep with him. And he didn't want to drive the Jeep all the way out there because the Jeep is pretty uncomfortable for stuff like that. So he says, Dad, you have a truck, trailer. Can we just put it on there? You drive me all the way out to California from North Carolina. Drop me off, and then you just drive back. And I said, absolutely, I will. And now he's coming back. And do you know what he asked? (laughs) So we're going all the way back out here in a few weeks to help him to get all the way back. The Lord, and that's true of me, a very imperfect dad. How much better is his love and his love for our voice and his love for us to call upon him? And so the man, verse 51, he says, this is what I want. Let me recover my sight. And so application here, let me encourage you to bring your dominating burden to the Lord. Your dominating burden is the thing that literally, no matter what you're praying about, it slips in through the back door because that's what you care about. That's what you need. I always tell people this. If you have a dominating burden, Stop the charade of the rest of your prayer and just take it to the Lord. Because whatever you try to do first, if it's a dominating burden, it's always going to interrupt. It's the elephant in the room of your mind. So just give it to the Lord. Start there. You have a dominating burden. If Christ himself were standing here today and he says, what do you want me to do for you? What would you say? Interestingly, the text doesn't say you only get one. It's not a genie. One wish. That's it. Just one. And some of you, you have been around the block a while in terms of walking with the Lord, and so you want me to caveat this very quickly because you know that passages like James says, man, we ask and you don't get because what you want is simply to spend on your own pleasures. And so we want to make sure that we don't send people out and say, yeah, just ask whatever you want. You're going to get it. It's not how it works. In fact, you remember last week, Jesus is approached by two of his disciples, James and John. They come and they say, we want you to do anything that we ask of you, whatever it is that we ask. And amazingly, he uses the same sentence, what do you want me to do for you? And they ask for seats of glory and honor in his upcoming kingdom. They do not receive the seats. Instead, they receive correction. So it is true 
Passages like 1 John chapter 5, this is the confidence we have toward him that if we ask anything according to his will, according to his will, he hears us. But I want you to notice something. Jesus still asked James and John what they wanted. And one of the reasons that he invites us to come to him with, this, with real desires that are not always refined and wrapping around his will is because he knows that time spent with him has a refining element to the desires of our heart that over a period of time, our desires become more and more and more like his. There was a great theologian named Garth Brooks not long ago, and he wrote a song. And in the song, he says, I thank God for unanswered prayers. What's happening there? He looks back at a time when he was praying for something. He thought that he wanted so much, he didn't get it. God gave something else, and he looks back and he goes, God knew better than me. God tends to give us what we would pray for if we knew everything he knows. But he wants us to come. You see, some of us today, I'm going to say, what do you want Jesus to do for you? And his will may look like this, and our desire is perpendicular. It's not in alignment. And so what does he do? He says, come back and pray. Come back and pray again. Tell me what you want. 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 We're waiting, and suddenly what's happening is our will, our heart, is growing more and more and more in alignment with his heart. And so he keeps saying, Just tell me. I know better than you, but tell me. Keep telling me. You see, there's passages such as um, Hosea chapter 6, verse 3. I love this passage. It says, let us press on to know the Lord. His going out is as sure as the dawn. Now, what does that mean? Press on to know the Lord. He says, his going out, his activity, his, his, what he's like, what he does is sure, meaning it's certain, it's credible, it's predictable. It's as predictable as the dawn. Most of us, we've seen the dawn, maybe even recently, okay? But if you studied the dawn, and if you lived in a place, you could know with some measure of certainty, it's going to come up right over there, around this time. This is what it's going to look like. Why? Because it's predictable. It happens all the time. And what he's saying is this, is the more that we come before the Lord, the more we open his word, and the more we're talking to him, the more that he's refining us, and the more that we're understanding his will and his ways. His will is what he wants us to do. His ways is what he's like. So when our boys were little, and if I gave them instruction and left the house, they could look and say, my dad's will, dad's will is that we would do this. But what if I didn't give them any instruction? What if they got into a little scenario where I hadn't instructed it immediately? Well, if they know me well enough, they know my ways. And so they could say, he didn't tell us what to do in this situation, but we know him well enough that we believe this is what he would want. And the more we spend time with the Lord, the more we're praying to the Lord, the more we're in his word, the more we understand what he wants us to do, And the more we understand what he's like when we don't know what to do. The third thing, and last, I want you to see is that Jesus displays his mercy and power to heal. What Jesus does here in this very last verse before we get to chapter 11 is something actually historic. You see, Isaiah chapter 35 tells us that when the Christ comes to save, he's going to do something. One of the things, the markers of what he's going to do when he's coming to Jerusalem to save us from our sin is he's going to open up the eyes of the blind. And here in chapter 10, verse 52, the verse before he comes into Jerusalem, he opens up the sight of a blind man. Now Matthew, as I said, also tells this story. And in this moment, Mark doesn't explain what Matthew does. 
In Matthew's version of the story, it says that once he said, let me recover my sight, it says the compassion so filled the heart and the gut of Jesus that it forced his hands to literally rise, reach up, and touch his eyes. He was completely healed. And this is when Mark then begins his end of his story in verse 52, and he says this. He says, now go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. This is interesting to me. Your faith has made you well. You see the word made you well? That's a Greek word. It's sozo. Some of you have had some theology, maybe background. Perhaps you've heard the word soteriology. It's the study of salvation. The word sozo means it saved you. It says your faith has saved you. You believed that I was the Christ. You believed. You confessed it. You called out to me for mercy. You knew that I had the heart to stop and call to a blind beggar out in the fields. You knew me well enough. And he was saved. So as we close, let me encourage you to acknowledge that we have a deeper need than what we see. I've asked the question. Many people ask the question, and it's a great question. Did Bartimaeus ask for the right thing? Of course, we can all understand why. I think it's the right thing. You know, it's interesting that Jesus never said just one thing, but he only asked for one thing. You say, well, why in the world would people say, did he ask for the right thing? Here's why. I believe that he was saved on the basis of verse 52. But for a blind man to ask for sight and not to call out to Christ in salvation, if God were to honor that request, that person would see and then die and then be separated from Christ forever in hell. And that's why I say there are things in life that are really important to us that sometimes we can't see. What Bartimaeus needed more than anything, Jesus was about to go and do in Jerusalem. For a week later, Jesus would die on a cross, and darkness would fill the earth as a reflection of Jesus being plunged into that darkness. But then he rose from the dead, inviting us to put our faith and trust in him, to repent our belief that we can save ourselves, to put our trust completely, entirely upon Christ, to confess him as Lord of our life. And the Bible says if we will, we will be completely forgiven of our sin and completely saved, justified, given his righteousness. And if we don't, I want you to know something. Whatever it is that God would give you, you would be impoverished forever. We could stand here, and if we do not put our faith in Jesus Christ and ask him to give us the gift of faith and be Given that gift, he could give us money that we want. He could give us health that we want. He could give us family that we want. He could give us a job that we want. He could give us everything that we want. But if we didn't have faith in Christ, Jesus says what? What good is it to gain the whole world and lose your soul? Your most important need today, no matter what your burden is, is to have a relationship with Christ. And so if you don't, call out to him in faith. And for those of you who do know him as Savior and Lord, he wants you to call to him now. What is the burden on your heart? Let me encourage you. Let me close here. Let me urge us to pray for one another. There are accounts all over Mark where the person who is in need can't bring themselves to Christ. You guys remember these, right? There's a man who's paralyzed. He has to get to Jesus, but he can't get there on his own. But a good thing he has friends. Well, how did this guy get there? I don't know if you noticed this, but Jesus says, call him. And they said, get up, take heart. How did he get there? I don't know. Maybe Jesus played colder, warmer, 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 really hot, really, really hot. My guess is somebody helped him get there. Jesus tells us through the Apostle Paul, bear one another's burdens. And that's what we're gonna do now. In all of our spaces this morning, all of the rooms, all the places, we're gonna respond by singing and praying. And if you happen to be somebody who has a burden and you've brought it to the Lord over and over and over again and you're simply tired and you need help, you need someone else to help you, take it to the Lord in prayer. And I wanna ask you to come forward during these songs. There's gonna be leaders who are here as well as in all of our spaces who can pray for you. And let me tell you something about the people. 
They're not more than you. This is not a bunch of super hired holy people that Jesus is gonna listen to more than you. But if you need help and someone else to be able to take it to the Lord with you, we wanna be able to do that. If not, you can pray right where you're at. So let me pray and then let's respond. Father in heaven, we bow before you. Thank you that you invite us to come to you at any time with confidence and to pour out the real desires of our heart knowing that perhaps those desires are your desires and you're going to answer that prayer, or perhaps simply knowing that as we draw near to you, that you're going to refine those desires and that we're going to want something different tomorrow than we do today that's more in alignment with your will. So help us to be the church that we are, brothers and sisters who pray for one another and help one another now. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.